So welcome everybody. Thank you to this panel session. I'm very excited to discuss today where enterprise architecture is today, what does the future hold, and getting a seat at the table. I'm joined today, uh, and I'll let each of you do quick introductions, but uh, Shoma, Jordy, and Grant. Shoma, if you wouldn't mind, just a quick title introduction, and we'll move on. You bet. Uh, Shoma Chakravarti, Vice President, Enterprise Architecture, Verizon. Perfect. Jordy? So welcome, everybody. My name is Jordi Decker, and I'm the CTO at Value Blue. Wonderful. Grant. Grant Ecker, Vice President at Walgreens Boots Alliance over architecture globally. Perfect. My name is Daniel Hebdam, the Chief Strategy Officer at Mega, and we're going to get right into the topic for today. So starting with a little bit on where is enterprise architecture now, I do view that enterprise architecture as a practice. I try to look at it from why it exists, why each of us are in the function or why we produce the products that we do. And my current thinking is that we're helping organizations bring their strategy and their operations together. We're designing future states that bring and make strategies a reality. And around the table, we'll start Shoma, agree, disagree, and maybe a little bit of how that plays in for you at Verizon. I do agree. Um, at Verizon, the enterprise architecture function uh, is a bridge between the business strategy and the technology strategy. Um, it's a living practice. I like that you alluded to it as a practice. Yes, fantastic. And it, it has been guiding our digital transformation. So that's how I see it. Perfect. Grant? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I'll, I'll agree with everything Shoma has said. I think there's also a, um, a bit of a role we play in, in two areas. I like to call it um, uh, the chief family counselor where we help to bring the, uh, the CIO's team together, right? And, and things that they might struggle with. Um, and there could be some religion in there. And I think we're also the chief coach to bring the technologists together to bring sort of the, the method to the madness when things may not make sense. Well, hey, let's just look at this from the multiple dimensions. And what do are, what are the technology teams come up with? I think that's a really important role we play in addition to what Shoma said around shaping the business strategy and aligning us to execute. It's also kind of the, the, the take the toys out and play, but also let's, let's clean our room and uh, ensure that we're in a good place to execute. Uh, one quick reaction to that before I jump to you, Jordy, is that I use an analogy and I, I like the wording you use, Grant and Coach, of when we're in the high speed transformation and if you're dealing with agile teams, they're the players, if we use a sports analogy, and the architects can help play the role of coach by coordinating and orchestrating. Jordy, do you see similarly the alignment of strategy with operations in an EA space, and especially from a vendor in the space perspective, do you have a different outlook? Yeah, well, uh, I agree uh, with it. I, I th always think that EA can be the guide and inspirator for change, uh, but I also th think that we need to be more articulate uh, about it, uh, though, because uh, we are at the, on the verge of big things coming up with, with digital transformation and so forth, of course. So I also think that the EA can be uh, the guide and inspiration to even create new digital business models and to operationalize those things in the operating model uh, to get things in motion. As companies are becoming more and more IT dependent, of course. So it is about business strategy, IT strategy, and operation, operationalizing uh, the things. And I do uh, like the fact that you also mentioned coach as you see coach and counselor and guide and inspirator. Uh, it's, it's the practice where uh, you need to align everything and everyone within your organization as I see it to move forward. Yeah, excellent. Just to let the audience know, if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat. I will glance over for now and then see if there's a question we'll inject it into the conversation. So the next question I had prepared was, where does the panel see the most value from EA practices today? And if you can give some advice or examples that might help audience members, maybe sharpen or enhance their own practices. Does anybody want to start with this one? Yeah. Jordan, yeah, yeah. So what I see is that uh, business is IT nowadays, right? So there is no business, there is no IT, business is IT. And it's blended due to the digital transformation and all innovations that come with it. And so EO 
EA reaches the business strategy and even comes to the boardroom. But I do need th do think that you need to spread the word a bit more because the old way of doing EA is to me is is dead. We need to be more agile. We need to be more outgoing. And um, as nowadays agility comes in more and more, of course. So and you also mentioned uh, it, it. It's only speeding up more and more. So how do you do how do you do that from the EA perspective? So you need to jump on the agile world, uh, do become more and more into the into the projects, do more into projects. And I think that the era of EA is now, uh, but you need to reorganize uh, yourself uh, a bit to uh, to do it, to be able to go forward and to be lean and agile. Because the old way of project start architectures and um, uh, big designs up front are not uh, doing it anymore, I think. Grant, do you want to respond, but also add your own views? Yeah, um, I think there's a really important role that EA plays in sort of bringing groups together. So an individual solution architect or individual area or product architect will be looking at their space. And I think it's a key role of EA to help identify the, the larger scope efforts, the larger impact efforts, and to be able to connect them across the ecosystem of technologists that work in that space that really incubate that collaboration as far left in the process as possible. So that starts out when we look at capability modeling against you know, business imperatives to understand where are the hot spots, kind of as I, I talked about earlier today, but that follows through into execution as we get into the depth of design, do we have the right technologists and the right technical architects engaged to ensure we're following the patterns and the approaches that, uh, that allow us to get scale and speed? Excellent, Shoma? I want to build on what um, both Grant and Jordi have said. Um, I think that uh, EA uh, really, uh, there's this analogy of the architect elevator where you're, uh, this, is a, uh, this is something that Gregor Hopp, who was uh, a CTO at Google for a while, had written about this architect elevator where the enterprise architects are navigating moving information and communication and influence from the penthouse all the way to the other floors of the organization. And I think that is where EA brings the most value. So building on what Grant says, I uh, have um, experienced that it is in EA where the dots can be connected across the enterprise in a way that really enhances the meaning or the opportunity or the weakness or the gap. Um, the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, again, uh, alluding to this elevator, uh, to what Jordi said, it's very important that uh, there isn't sort of this, you know, this is business, this is IT. I think EA has that special value to add, um, bridging, bridging the various um, objectives across the organization. So very fantastic, and I, I think with mature architecture practices, both the moving left, the elevator, and of course the merge of the business and IT are imperatives. Uh, I know that when we talk to the market, if there is an organization that has maybe a new EA practice, maybe they're not yet well established, any advice from each of you on how they can get to that level of where the business in particular accepts that movement on the elevator, that shift to the left, or that inclusion that business and IT are aligned? Yeah, I'll start. Um, to sure. me, that's an area where you really need to start with understanding what is driving the, the, the imperative to have an architecture practice. That involves a lot of listing. So you meet with your CIO, you meet with uh, his or hers direct reports, understand what, they, what their hopes and aspirations are, what their pain points are, and you might find it could be that that missing seat at the strategy desk, or it could be we have a totally unstable deployment that's you know keeping us up at night, and we need help firefighting that out. And I think embracing the opportunities in front of you and building from that, either top down, starting with a strategy engagement, or bottom up, building the foundations of stability, stepping into sort of strategy tracks, and then stepping into innovation. Sort of build from where the source of resonance is 
because if you just start off and, and go, I want a strategy shop, that's where I'm going to start. If the organization's in pain and they're not able to execute on today's priorities, there's not going to be a lot of interest in letting you in the door to those other conversations. Jordy, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree. And it's about uh, knowing your business, uh, but also showing that you know uh, not only the business, but only what you're talking about. So it's about knowledge. Uh, if you're just starting out, it's about you help, have to build your credibility. And, um, and from my own personal experience, if, you, uh, if you're just a new uh, guy in, in the business, and I worked at a, at a large financial institution once, and it was the first week when I, when I came in, they asked me to do, uh, give advice on the merger, and I didn't know anything about it. Uh, yet, but I knew uh, the technology of the of the of the other company they didn't want to take over, and uh, because of that, and I could explain it just in simple terms that the business could understand. I was directly able to to give the right advice, and the, the merger was going forward. So it's knowing your stuff, getting forward, uh, and um, if you got the chance, of course, uh, jump to the table. But it's about. Uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Know your know your business. Show what you're capable of. Uh, get on, uh, get from your uh, door and get into the room and talk to people and show what you can do. Be articulate about it. Uh, that's the most important thing that I that I see that actually works. And they, they practice not just building the the thing from from the office or in a tool or whatever. Uh, talk with people and get them on board. It's all about communication, as I see it. So we can add to coach uh, the translation and communication as we're riding the elevator between the different levels to make sure everybody can understand. Shoma, anything to add advice on someone who maybe is less mature or starting off to build a practice as successful as yours? I, I do have some advice and I have many scars. Have you done it <laughs> um, myself? Um, what I found uh, was a very big success factor was an empowered enterprise architecture function. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, start the enterprise architecture function at Verizon, but the starting point was one of great empowerment uh, by the CIOs. And also, I wanted to say that a successful enterprise architecture function is like a, a contagious culture. So uh, the culture of architectural thinking, the culture of the importance of design, the culture of the importance of reuse and knowledge sharing, that is what enterprise architecture, uh, successful enterprise architecture rests upon. And I just wanted to say that you know the culture, the uh, culture of empowerment, the culture of coaching, the culture of sharing, all of that is critical to success. So I think that's a great point. We've seen over years what we've called the viral effect is that an EA practice may initially struggle to get off the ground, but once they do and that culture takes over, it can be rapid and that culture is really a valuable aspect. And so it looks into that the era of EA is now, you'll see trending phrases, things like privacy by design, security by design, even sustainability by design, which is more and more organizations contemplating the role of architecture in the production of products or the operation of business. At, at my organization, we have an expression to help launch new practices you may be perceived initially as noisy by those outside of EA. First, build value, build usefulness. And that can be to show what you know, communicate value as Jordi explained earlier. And then as you continue to get that culture to expand, you build some trust and you earn your way to that influential level where you can innovate. But you have to check along the way, are those outside of architecture seeing the value from your practice, not just those within? Uh, let me see, there is a question that came up. So I'm gonna read it as it is. Please, please share your thoughts on how do we manage a fine balance between top-down EA strategic goals on investments and capabilities, business value, collaboration between portfolios, governance uh, from the bottom-up tactical perspective, such as pain points, business, functional fit, technical fit, NFRs, SLAs, standard patterns, reference perspective architectures. So to summarize, 
how do we manage the balance between that top down approach, the higher level perspective of EA and that bottom up approach, the lower, more detailed granular perspective of EA. Jordy, you want to start? Yeah, so uh, what I believe is that uh, you cannot go forward uh, anymore with the big design up front, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you need to create lean baselines um, and lean reference models that you uh, can use in day-to-day -day, uh, projects where you need those guidelines from the top and use them from the bottom up, of course, to, to create the agile designs that you need in your projects. Uh, and you only need to uh, try to um, uh, document the deviations from those lean baselines. So as an architect, you need to be real considerate about what do we actually need to store and give the people in the, on the bottom up level, on the, on the bottom level uh, to do their day-to-day uh, -day work. And it, it's, it's a thin line, but we, we really need to change the way we do architecture with, uh, with project start architecture and so forth. The big piles of, of documents that you move into the projects that needs to be be out there uh, we get uh, need to get rid of that and when you find that balance i think that uh, you find the best of both worlds so you get the strategy into the into the change and the uh, bottom up, the bottom up people can still have the flexibility to create the designs that they actually need to, to move forward so there's the connection as i see it I'm going to inject a thought because I'm curious as Shoma and Grant look to respond what their reaction would be that I've seen success with what we've called a hybrid EA practice, which is that you are looking again to align the strategy and the operations, which is that balance. And in doing so, if we give the architects a level of accountability to some of the successes of projects or whatever programs, whatever delivery mechanism you use, then that helps where if there is a bottom-up constraint or challenge, they can coordinate back with the top-down perspective to make adaptations or vice versa. If there's something at the strategic level that just isn't feasible today, they can see that and again, make pivots or adaptations. How do you, each of you, Grant will start with, manage that balance between top-down and bottom-up? Well, this is why I really like federated architecture approaches. Um, I think that's super important that we empower the architects in the community, to your point, Dan, or Daniel, sorry. Um, I, I really believe this starts with a conversation with the CIO's deputies, his, his one level downs. And you align your architecture practice, your EA practice, to have your top level reports aligned to those deputies. So what I basically find is you start with a three-way conversation between the architect aligned to that deputy and yourself and that, and that leader, and you talk about the priorities. First, I mean, I try to shape and influence that a little bit. Here's what I notice is the architecture gaps from the organizational standpoint. If we want to be more engaged in strategy, if we want to be more engaged in driving out some information assets, talk about those kinds of goals with that leader. Ask them what their goals are for the year and start to see some of those they're going to cherry pick off yours, right? Which is super helpful because otherwise they may not have said them. But now you have them picking a couple that they're highlighting and uh, your architect in that space is listening. Now he's gonna take, he or she is gonna take that to the community of architects reporting up to that CIO direct report and build a community that leverages EA's offerings, right? The stuff on the left and the stuff on the right to achieve the, the pain points and the strategic engagements we wanna create. And all of them are going to have resonance in that CIO staff members objectives, which allows us to have our objectives in the central EA team align with the objectives of the architects in his or her team, and then have a common alignment on moving forward. And I think it's super important you do this up front, because if you just show up at their job site and say, hey, boss, what do you need? They're going to say, hey, can you go sweep the floor and also help us move rocks from this side of the yard to the other? And if you simply bring the menu first and present that of where do you want to be a year from now? Where do you want to be three years from now? You can also get those, hey, we're going to build a skyscraper next to this one. Can we ensure that that area stays clear and we don't run any plumbing or pipes in the area that we're going to be building another structure? So that to me, I think, is that balancing conversation that really starts with the sponsorship. Excellent. Shoma? Um, I, uh, I, I have to say that we have also uh, implemented uh, a combination, a hybrid 
um, operating model for enterprise architecture. So we do have uh, the mechanism to scale and be line of business specific while adhering to a common methodology, a common set of directional technology standards. The one thing that I would add to answer Vijay's question is that uh, in our uh, architecture organization, we actually have uh, called out um, you know, solution architecture and technology architecture separately. And that at the outset allows us to sort of navigate from uh, a business architecture to a solution architecture to the non-functional uh, and technology aspects of the architecture. And, uh, you know, kind of, again, uh, make sure that it's, um, it's iterative um, and, 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 you know, we don't encounter problems of security or performance or latency um, in this entire cycle. Excellent. I do see a trend for increasing attention paid to the non-functional requirements as we get and advance and expand into the speed of change of technology. Uh, there is another question that came up, and, and I think everyone can see it. I'm just going to read part of it then. Uh, I would like to touch upon uh, business and financial value realization aspect. So in the modern age of the rapid change of technologies, the business sees this problem. How do we handle some of this. So anybody want to touch on that question? It is in the chat if you want to read it more thoroughly. Let me see. Yeah, I'll go first this time. Sure. So, <laughs> Jay, um, so uh, you know, I think that you're absolutely right. In our organization, enterprise architecture is very much in the uh, funnel where investment cases and uh, the corresponding design and high level level of efforts are being um, are being compiled so i think that uh, as part of uh, our method for building those investment cases we do have uh, a business case we do have kpis we do have an roi model so i think it's important to do that up front so I just want to say that you know we find those KPIs. While you may enhance them, enrich them, in some cases you may not be able to meet them, but at least you have that governance at the outset before the financial prioritization. And then the second thing uh, that I uh, wanted to address is shiny objects. I have found enterprise architecture to be a great um, restraining force uh, in the chase that an organization succumbs to, uh, you know, for shiny objects. Grant, I, I got to call on you next because your background image, of course, is a large shiny object. It is indeed. <laughs> Where is do indeed. you stand on the emerging tech and, and this balance? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. My vice president of architecture at Lowe's back in the day, he had a uh, golden squirrel on his desk for that exact reason, right? It's a big part of EA to avoid the shiny object syndrome. I just love that you mentioned that. Um, I think you really have to be business outcome focused in this space, as, as Shoma pointed out correctly. It's, uh, you know, if you're investing to modernize for modernization's sake, um, you're gonna have some really difficult financial outcomes to deal with. Uh, there needs to be an ROI, there needs to be KPIs or OKRs that we're using, and we have to be really clear on where the business is going to be um, with these particular um, driving changes. The other thing that I've noticed in this space, and I think many of us who've been through the transformation journeys can attest, there's very seldomly an on-time, on-budget, on-scope journey when it comes to massive transformation and digitization, right? It's like a story of getting there, but with some skinned knees and some bruised elbows and kind of making our way across that finish line. So I really find that when you, you hit your first bump and you fall down your first time, which is going to happen, you know, you build a bridge across the, the ocean, it's, it's not going to there'll be some fallen pillars, which is kind of what we're doing. So I think it's really important that you understand the outcomes you're driving so you don't stop in the middle of the journey and say, what are we even doing here? Um, so to me, I think Shoma's point, I just want to uh, triple underline it is spot on about 
being really clear on that. So when you hit those bumps, you 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 know which direction you're moving and why. Yeah. Jordy, anything to add? No, yeah, I, I completely agree. So it's about you need to know what the business out outcomes should be, uh, and also the value to the customer, of course, what it should be. That's where you need to start. And if you have a clear view on that, that's where you uh, work your way backwards. So it shouldn't be about the shiny objects, so to say, as you as you spoke in there before about. Uh, it's not about that. It's not about digitalization as a goal on its own, of course. Uh, you need to know why you are doing this anyway. Um, so, and where is the market heading towards, or where is the industry heading towards? And that's all about customer value, uh, business value, and it's about getting inside, as uh, both of my fellows in the independent already said, it's about business outcomes. If you have those good in place, if you have a good eye on that, then um, yeah, then you also have your eye on, on the financial impact and where or uh, where you need to digitalize or where you don't want to digitalize. Excellent. So I like the focus on the business outcomes as one way to avoid the shiny object problem. And I do love that, Grant, you have that in your background image. It's just, it's just perfect. <laughs> one of the things I would ask is that if, if we work to identify and clarify the business outcomes and really architect the direction to make them reality, how do you get credit for the work the architecture practice plays in that transformation? as opposed to perhaps the project teams or the programs that deploy the result of your architecture. Shoma, you want to start? Sure. I, um, I'm so uh, sort of uh, uh, taken by the question uh, because uh, I often hear this. Uh, I often encounter this where, um, uh, you know, because the architecture work is um, so much at the, like, it is so much the foundation but it's not uh, it's the delivery that realizes the value that often you know the the limelight and the credit obviously goes to the team that's taken the torch to the finish line so it's very interesting that you say that i think that um uh, one way to uh, to counter that is to really uh, partner uh, and stay engaged and stay vested in the success of the delivery uh, by the architecture team. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, Daniel, a pitfall to avoid would be like being an architecture team that says, I've done the designs, now it's your problem. So I think staying engaged and, you know, being vested in the success of the delivery teams, uh, I've experienced counters this, um, uh, this uh, issue of you know, not getting enough credit for that upfront work. I think that's excellent advice, Grant. I'm going to challenge the question a little okay. bit, uh, but but with care. So <laughs> I think if we accept this question at face value, we've already kind of lost. I think there's room for all of us to succeed together, the project team and EA together, right? I think really successful architects would say they feel like they're a part of that team and that they play a role in that. In that, And I think that those projects teams feel like they're a part of EA playing the role in shaping things before they get into delivery. So while the reality is there that if we aren't careful to kind of share our successes, but in a way that that's clapping and applause for the organization, then we are at a place where we could end up being potentially taken for granted or not necessarily appreciated in the organization. So there's something real here, even if I want to challenge the question a bit, like we have to claim our wins. Um, and I find the best way to do that is to create an inclusive environment of appreciation across the community of architects and the community of technologists that ultimately are shaping these outcomes. I couldn't agree with each of you more. And it ties into the mention earlier, the hybrid organization, EA has to have skin in the game or it doesn't work. And so I'm with you. And I think that's where you'll get a shared credit. It's not one or the other. Jordy? Yeah, as I'm looking at it as well. So I, I, I agree, but I also think that, uh, well, day-to-day -day enterprise architect doesn't have that big of an ego. Uh, so it's, it's more a team player. Um, and so they don't usually take their win like, 
I put in the win, but I think that they feel like when they operate like a team, uh, as part of a team, and they the team says, well, we have delivered faster, better, and within budget, and also we uh, reached the business outcomes that we aimed at, and we couldn't have done it without you, or the other way around, uh, for the architect, you, uh, you have reached the goals that I set out, but it was only due to you, as the team, that it helps. So I, I think that it's more like like being part of the team and seeing part as a team instead of the party pooper, so to say, that is the policeman. Um, if you're not a policeman anymore and you're seen as the as part of the change team, then you're a winner. I think. Excellent. I, I think we're all in great agreement. I love it. So there is another question that's been posed, and it's that most EA initiatives projects are led by IT. How do we ensure that we get business engagement? How do we ensure the business capabilities are real business capabilities and not just the IT perspective of the business? And then related, do you see business asking to make architecture processes more lean? So I'm going to tie those even as two different individuals that Jordy mentioned earlier, business and IT are, you can't separate them anymore, but there are still titles and functions that manage budgets and priorities separately. How do we bring these together from an EA perspective? Who wants to start on this one? I'll start and I'll be a little obnoxious, um, apologies. <laughs> but um, the talk I did earlier today really talks about this. So Fantastic. to me, the advantage is, uh, the, I'll give you the, the four second version, well, probably a little more than four seconds. But <laughs> if you can build relationships with those IT stakeholders, understand their pain points and have them facilitate and broker relationships with you and, those, and the business and to start to shape things, then you won't feel like that you're behind the eight ball helping an IT organization after something moves into sort of the execution or, or implementation model. You can be out front helping bring that IT team to the strategy table and shaping what those outcomes, uh, sorry, what those efforts ultimately become. So that's the journey is to first empathize and become a part of the IT team, then to be able to broker their entry into this into the strategy conversation and then to be able to sort of hand off the baton back to them where you notice the hot spots in the investment plans that are going to need their pre-planning to be effective in creating the foundational programs that will enable multiple business areas to execute yeah i, I gotta say having done a number of these panels they can be interesting when there's divergence but in this case it's super interesting how aligned everyone is in not only in the singular answers but across each answer right the elevator moving up and down related Love to that. what you just said the coaching the shifting left the business it coordination everything it's it's on such a theme that's just powerful so i hope it's resonating with the audience because i'm really i'm loving the reactions and responses shoma do you want to add to what grant mentioned or have a different perspective yeah um I wanted to say that I think if most EA initiatives and projects are being led by IT, I think that's um, that's a flag, um, you know, and you have to kind of um, ask why. Uh, it's possible, it's possible, depending on uh, an enterprise's journey, that it's the right, it's the right um, trend. However, it is one that, uh, strikes me as um, odd and, uh, you know, demanding attention. Uh, in my own experience, that's not often the case for a healthy EA function. Uh, in my experience, EA initiatives, especially the large, well-funded ones, as we've said before, as, as Grand Jordi, Daniel and I were saying before, are usually tied to some sort of business transformation. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, that it's probably a good uh, thing to, you know, um, dig under. And then the other thing, uh, again, I just wanted to share, uh, you know, to the second question, Jeremy's question, do you see your business asking to make the architecture process more lean? So I wanted to say something that I think it's very important for us architects to constantly question uh, if we are um, if we are overdoing it. In other words, I'm a big proponent of lean and uh, what is necessary in terms of process roadmaps documentation. Great, Jordi, anything to add? 
Yeah, well, I agree with with the last thing that Sean said. It's all about the, the just enough architecture, so lean and not over architecting over architecting things. And I also think about what what I see is that uh, businesses also often think in applications, so they want to change an application or want to do something in the application landscape. So even in the business, they talk about uh, IT instead of business outcomes and processes and the things they want to deliver to the customer. So that's also why I think that it's often IT centric because it's often about the IT landscape, the application landscape, and also the business is talking about that. And I think that the enterprise architect shouldn't be in the IT section. I think it's an IT savvy business consultant, so to say. So an no, enterprise architect really knows the business, should know the business. It shouldn't be seen as an IT person. So it's, it's the bridge maker between uh, both worlds uh, as I see it. And uh, I also think that the, the, the reason why uh, a lot of initiatives are IT initiatives is due to the fact that we have the digital transformation in place. So due to the digital transformation, a lot of uh, technology innovations are coming in and it's all IT driven, of, often uh, IT driven. That's where you shouldn't be talking about IT anymore. It's just adding business value from the IT perspective. And that's a mind shift, I think, that both business and IT should make in the coming period. Excellent. Uh, I'd love to add on here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna steal from from Shoma's box over here. I love how we're Hollywood squares. We actually can see where each other are. Um, you know, I think I think it's quite funny um, the, 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 how how she mentioned there's a real problem right in the architecture uh, in the treatment of architecture from the organization capacity if we if it feels this way, and I've seen this happen in a few organizations now. Right, the accordion of Bill D A and then push it all back out to the edges and then build it back, right? Where that just feels a little bit too heavy handed. When we fail to get lean, right? When we fail to adjust to the priorities of the organization and we get too self-serving in building our documentation or in process constraining organizations from being able to push forward, the organization revolts and it takes the power back. It was always theirs to begin with. And I think we have to remember that so you could be in a phase where the organization has said enough we're pulling it back to the to the individual business lines and they're going to make the decisions and you're going to support the math um, it could just be that you found yourself out of balance and now you're recovering from that so i think respecting that point where you are and building things back into centralization but build back better is the phrase i would give you to remember to be able to make sure we learn the lean lesson and that we respect that the business line is accountable to their outcomes and to be an enabler of their success. Um, it's just about reproving the value because I think you are in a moment where the value is questioned and that's why you're feeling the way you are in that, in that sentiment. Yeah, I would add to that. It's one of the shifts we're seeing, of course, from that academic EA where there's too much emphasis on documentation, heavy templates, mm -hmm. to outcome-driven EA, which is really enough architecture to enable the outcome or the result. And so I think that shift is there. I would add it's important for architecture practices to take the temperature outside of the EA group, how they're perceived. How is it when you ask a non-architect, what do you think of the value of the EA practice of the work and the deliverables? They might say, ah, you guys, you're documenting everything. Well, then red flag. Uh, or, you no, know, man, you guys saved us so many times because you were able to deliver all of these foundational elements that enabled the transformation. Great. So check the temperature. We have about five minutes left. So if we could talk a little bit of one last piece of advice, we've already given quite a bit, and, and I think it's been a fantastic dialogue, as well as something maybe you see on the horizon. Where is EA going that might be a little bit of a different view than others might contemplate? So advice or future direction vision? Jordan, you want to start? Yeah, I can start and I can do a mix of both, I guess. Perfect. Uh, well, so it's, it's advice and where it's heading towards a bit, uh, from my perspective, it is. So we already heard about it. It's, it's all about agility and a change, change going with the speed of light. And the amount of innovations is real mind-blowing and organizations need to adapt um, or cease to exist, right? 
And um, so it requires an entirely different mindset in uh, governance and doing work. Uh, doing the work you already heard, Sean is stating it as well. It's about lean, lean baselines, just no documentation. Uh, that's where it's really heading towards. So you need to change the way you do govern your enterprise architecture and align it better with agile project delivery. That's where the real change will be. And if you see where the EA yeah, practice, well, what the value is, it's uh, and the mechanics that are changing. It's about integration. It's becoming more data driven and outcome driven. EA, yeah, as you mentioned yeah, a few times earlier. The just enough architecture, it's about collaboration, it's about democratization, it's getting things inside the business, not from the ivory tower, but decisions should be made within the place in the business itself. And the things that hit it is uh, why should we do this? It's due to the digital transformation and cloud ecosystems that are coming in, globalization, consumerization, remote work due to COVID 19 but also the modularization of enterprises that are coming in and you stated also something about and that was a nice one with business capabilities at some some point that you can decomponentize your organization by doing business capability planning in that way i think that's the way forward and agile is Excellent. a given so yeah you perfect be on the train thank you shoma um, i like what grant said earlier and i just wanted to sort of uh, double, double down on that advice. Um, I really think uh, the enterprise architecture function should um, find a way to connect the value generated uh, from it. Uh, in some cases, this will be you know the KPIs that the business transformation projects um, aspired for have moved. In some cases, it's efficiency. In some cases, it is um, you know standardization uh, of um, effort, prioritization, directional technology platforms. So I think that's really important for us to uh, stay connected to you know how we are providing uh, value. And I think uh, the second thing I wanted to address is your ask about where it's headed. I uh, you alluded to it, Daniel. I really think there's a whole movement across the board of shifting left and automation, and it's um, it's a uh, it's encompassing enterprise architecture as well. I think we're going to see a lot more um, automated methods that are woven into CI/CD, um, uh, you know, and 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 like bringing design uh, as part of the. Uh, the pipeline, I think we're going to see a lot of that. Fantastic. Grant? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow uh, <laughs> Jordy's pen here for a minute. I think uh, I love what he had to say. How do you still have that? Um, I, I, I think what he said about product was, uh, it's, it's more of a stylus, isn't it? Is yeah. on. I think it's two directions, right? How do we become more of a strategic advisor on the front end and business outcome focused on the work that we take into our practice? And then how do we export that into an organization that's getting more agile, getting more product focused by bringing agile into how we work, by bringing product into how we do business architecture and having these kind of concepts fluidly become our language as well. So that's who we represent. And it's really important that we're fluidly treating. I mean, the CIO and their staff, that's our customer. And we engage the business on their behalf. So when we shape the IT strategy and then bring it back to them, we need to bring it back to them in the language that they work. And that's out of time. So fantastic. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation offline. Wonderful. Uh, but thank you, everybody. We'll see you either on LinkedIn or through emails, et cetera. Have a great day for those who attended. Thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.